that highlights you. <laughs> I remember when I did an art exhibition uh, many years ago, um, I was asked to, to uh, do an art exhibition in Nelspreet of a friend of mine. Never done art exhibitions before, but this young man, a South African, uh, Italian, South African born Italian, Fabrizio Caforio, and uh, I did his very first exhibition of wildlife. And um, eventually we, we got him onto the net bank checkbooks and the credit cards, you know, with all the spotted cats. And, and he became very famous. But um, I'll never forget that, that first exhibition, you know, when we had the people, we rented a, a facility in Elspreet and we invited people. And then he has these big canvases, you know, bigger than life almost. And, and uh, we sold four paintings that night and at a price that no other artist was selling at that time in South Africa. Because the, 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 the friend of mine, um, who Jean-Marie Julien, whose vision this Planet Studio was, um, he explained to me, you know, that diamonds do not know their own value. You know, you won't get a diamond, you know, nudging the diamond next to it in the ribs and saying, I'm a five carat. You? <laughs> I eat five carats a day. Um, he says, um, diamonds find their value in our appreciation. And art, you know, with diamonds today, the industry is so global and so big that they have ceiling values. You know, you have a global value to the product. And we're not talking black market value here. <laughs> and um, when you deal with art, though, there is no ceiling to it to its value because you're dealing with people's ability to appreciate. I think I posted on Facebook about a week or two ago, you know, how amazed one would sometimes be to hear what a certain painting sold for on the public platform in a public auction. And you think, why would people be prepared to pay such a ridiculous price for a painting? until you learn that it was an original Van Gogh. You see, and for so long we've, we've had to live with the idea that um, God actually made a little bit of a mistake when He made me. He didn't. Jesus is proof that God did not make a mistake when He made you. Jesus came to give testimony of your authentic original value could we ask the folk outside to please come in and settle down thank you so much i say jesus came with one mission one mandate not to start any religious movement but he came to unveil original authentic value clothed in human skin you manity you are god's idea and you have no competition. No wonder Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12 that while we compare ourselves by one another and compete with one another, we are without understanding. We miss the whole point. You see, there is an understanding that God unveils. And I'm so glad that in our age of technology we have discovered features in our technology where we can speak words like compatible and it makes sense. When you're in Bluetooth mode you can detect another uh, equipment that is also in Bluetooth and there's a communication in Bluetooth mode. I mean, if we spoke Bluetooth language some decades ago, people would start thinking, did I brush my teeth? You know, it's showing blue. I ate a blue gum earlier on. <laughs> but technology helps us, assists us to understand that they're in our quest as humans to communicate. 
we have always sought to connect our highways the Romans built you know the first highways on the planet but they got the idea from a prophetic word in Isaiah chapter 40 where God says every high place shall be brought low every valley shall be filled up every crooked place shall be made straight even the rough places shall be made smooth you see God saw a connection that is not going to disappoint his expectation so every excuse that we could possibly have of distance and not connected Jesus bridged once and for all in the incarnate word God connected God was in Christ when he reconciled the world to himself you know what that does it puts our efforts our best most eloquent efforts to reconcile ourselves with our maker it puts those efforts out of business the business of religion is to sell you ideas first of all that there is distance which is the, a lie to begin with because in him we live and move and have our being remember Paul quoting Arat as a Greek philosopher who made this statement while the prophets in Israel were sleeping for 400 years 300 years before Christ Aratus saw that we are the offspring of God we are his idea to begin with we did not begin in our mother's womb we live and move and have our being in him when Paul declares this in Acts 17 he says the God of creation whom you worship in ignorance I love Paul's wisdom communicating with a bunch of Greek philosophers who inherited philosophies of many generations they've inherited the the mode of thinking of trying to invent God and build altars because their God was always an angry deity and we had to do all kinds of things to try and win a measure of approval so we would build altars and we would be prepared to sacrifice the most expensive sacrifice to hopefully to win the attention of an angry moody miserable God and here Paul arrives on the scene with a knowledge that God was in Christ when he reconciled the world to himself and now from within us Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 from within us God the same God of creation pleads with all of mankind everywhere not to become a reconciled hey that's the wrong message it's to be reconciled if reconciliation still has to happen then Jesus has no right to occupy the highest seat of authority as the executive authority of God in the very throne room of heaven <laughs> I know I'm pointing there but I'm meaning the innermost being <laughs> You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is God endorsing the redeemed innocence of the human race. If mankind was not innocent because of what happened on the cross in God speaking our language of judgment, then Jesus could not be raised from the dead. So we are invited to see with the Father what is always known to be true about us so if God was in Christ when he reconciled the world without their permission to himself but now he pleads with them because multitudes of people are living behind a pseudo veil a veil that religion erected to try and keep multitudes busy with the next latest recipe you see you don't need to break through anywhere when you begin to understand that God has broken through into your world 
And now the precious Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth, gives voice to the Father pleading from within us, to the world, to be ye reconciled. So Paul comes to the Greek audience in Acts 17 with this knowledge. And he says, the God you worship in ignorance, the creator of the universe, the author of everything, is not far from each one of us. As Christians? How many Christians were there in Paul's audience in Acts chapter 17? If you count them, you know, in our definition of Christian, we just find Paul standing there by his lonesome selves and saying, well, I'm going to plant a church here so that we can have a presence at least for Jesus in Greece. <laughs> Paul says, something happened to me. Paul had a from now on moment encounter. And that is why we preach. Because that encounter, that wow moment, belongs to every person on this planet. You see, we couldn't even begin to, to communicate glad tidings if the glad tidings was not connected to great joy, which belongs to how many people? To all people. You see, if I have glad tidings for the pirate supporters here tonight, talking soccer, or the sundowners, or the... I mean, we'd immediately be divided. Yeah. I'm always surprised going to remote areas in South Africa and addressing small groups in a remote place and see there's a guy with a pirate shirt and another guy with a sundowners and somebody else with the chiefs, you know. And how divided us humans are, just when it comes to any little social context. But here God comes in Christ, in the incarnate one. And he addresses the human race in one man. He speaks mother tongue language in incarnation. And in that moment, Paul declares God cancelled every definition of separation, every illusion of distance, even the rough places he made smooth. We so often feel the frustration when, when we're in areas, sometimes in cities, and you're trying to make a very important call on your mobile device, and it shows it only has one bar, and the one bar is kind of floating. And you're trying to download something, and it's, you're thinking, how can this be? I mean, we're living in the age of seamless connection. No, we're not. <laughs> but there is a seamless connection that surpasses technology. Yeah. It is when the God of creation connected himself in the person of his son, in the obedience of one man, through one act of righteousness. God brought hostility to an end. He brought ignorance to an end. When he declares our redeemed innocence, when he declares our redeemed oneness, so when Paul addresses these philosophers, he's not trying to win a debate to try and you know, introduce a new altar on the scene. This is going to be the Christian altar and here we can take 10% you know, at least. <laughs> but um, he wasn't in competition with man's most profound philosophy. Paul knew something. He writes about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. When he speaks about the motivation of his ministry. No, he didn't become a teacher of the word by profession. It wasn't a career choice. It was an unveiling of the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. So he says this beautiful word in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. He says, the love of Christ resonates within me. Sun echo is the Greek word. We'll try and get back to the thoughts that we.
picture of our oceans, we start hearing the, the, the sound shift from the ocean to the echo. Now the mountain is not creating the echo. The mountain merely reflects the sound that is there in the ocean. So when Paul speaks of the agape of God, he's not trying to wind up our love buttons, you know, to love me, try and love God more, you know, try and do things to me. That's the old law language. It always makes you feel a little bit guilty because you don't do it enough. Yeah. So you're trying to upgrade your, your love level. You know. It's time to love God more. I'm going to get up earlier next morning. I'm going to fast longer. I'm going to do this more. I'm always trying to do more so I can try and win the reluctance of God. So when Paul understands, remember now he's talking to the Greek philosophers, we're still in Acts 17, we're popping in our Acts 17 a few times this week. So here Paul has this heathen old audience, not one of them have said to the sinner's prayer, which by the way is something we invented this time, the record of the sinner's prayer in the Bible. And Paul didn't you know, go through the moments of trying to get people to make a decision to invite Jesus to him. He comes with an understanding with a human race that he, Paul, no longer knows according to the flesh. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but Paul's not just making an academic statement that we could convert into a doctrine. Paul is speaking a language that, that is so beautifully articulated and announced in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. He says the love, the agape of Christ soon echo resonates within me so if you come to visit us in Hermanus I've had people visit us there for the first time and they look up and say wow have you got a waterfall in the mountain because you can hear the water in the mountain I said no it's the ocean you see there's a reflection there's a reference a valid reference to where the sound comes from are you hearing me yeah. so Paul's not trying to just feel more polite towards people even the ones that really irritate him he's just listening to the sound of glad tidings of great joy you see when we discover the joy of the Lord we don't have to try and fake or invent our own Jesus never said in Mark 11 that you must have faith in God even if your calf skin leather covered expensive Bible says Jesus said in red letters have faith in God he didn't say that he said have the faith of God so what difference does that make that means I'm not trying to compete with with God when it comes to believing in Ephesians 4 Paul says there is only one valid faith not what we believe about God but what God believes about us <laughs> you see our faith does not invent God <laughs> so when we talk about the joy of the Lord you see we're talking about this word soon echo where does the echo come from what is the origin of the echo where does the sound come from in Paul's persuasion concerning this world is it a thumb suck is Paul just thinking oh from now I'm gonna just feel more positive try you know and be more positive towards the human race especially the Jews you know, I'm gonna be more tolerant towards my own people Paul discovers in the revelation of the righteousness of God meaning what God did right the old English word right wiseness we will spend a lot of time this week explaining the word righteousness wise to that which is right Paul says in Romans 1 verse 17 that the secret the key secret 
to the power of the gospel is in a revelation of what? Of the righteousness of God. Of what God did right, not what Adam did wrong. Yeah. Sure. And then he says this in Romans 1.17, it is from faith to faith. You know how we interpreted that verse? We made faith a little ladder to heaven. And so we're just going to go from faith to faith, and then next Sunday I'm going to have a step higher, and then my well, Wednesday I've fallen off again, so it's like snakes and ladders. So I'm just constantly, then I get to the ladder, and then the snake swallows me. And I start all over again. And the religion loves it, because they make their money that way. When Paul says it's from faith to faith, he uses the little Greek word, ek. Uh, I'm just floating around you, which is hallelujah. That's Romans. The R stands not for rand or dollar, it stands for Romans 1, verse 17. When Paul says from faith to faith, the word from in the Greek is the word ek. Don't confuse this with Pretoria ek, the Afrikaans ek in Cape Town. It's got nothing to do with Afrikaans. This word ek. ek. It's all about ek, though. It's about you are, I am, <laughs> we are. But the word ek is a very important word. The word ek always points to the source, to the origin. So Paul says it's ek, faith. Do faith. So if there is only one faith, what God believes, then it puts all our beliefs out of business. That's why the Christian community is perhaps the most divided community in the world. Because we're all fighting for the right to say what we believe and write volumes, libraries full of nonsense trying to support what we believe. There's only one valid faith. And Hebrews chapter 12 tells us, looking away unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of faith. Now, if Jesus is both the author and the finisher of faith, we don't need to look anywhere else. That's why Paul says, and I believe Paul wrote it, Paul says, look away. Look away from what? From the old language of the law. The old system that we've polluted our minds with for centuries. Look away from your efforts to try and get nearer my God to thee. You cannot get any closer to God than what you already are. The gospel announces a union, a oneness, that does not become valid by the time you believe it. Remember that first day when you got mathematics sorted? You're in grade one and your teacher tries to explain to a naughty class, listen, one apple plus another apple equals how many apples? And the penny drops and you get it. The moment you get it is not the moment that two becomes two. Two's been two before you. So when Paul says the love of Christ, the agape, oh, and I hope we have enough time in our next ten days to get to the word agape. I'll just write it down here because agape. You see, the love of God is not a, a brief sense of warm emotion that God floats in and out of. Every now and again, if you catch him in a good mood, oh man, the blessings are there. The agape is the constant of God. Because God equals agape. Agape is not something that God has. Agape is God. In Sabbath mode for all eternity. 
Let me explain to you. Just tell me when it's close to six and I forget. We've got to stop by six. Let's break up the word again. Argo, not a go like an English. Don't think English now. Argo, it's a long O. Argo, in the Greek, means to lead as a shepherd leads his sheep. The word pao, so there's the next word for you. Agape contains these two words. Ago, pao. Guess what the word pao means? It means rest. In Genesis 1.31, the God of creation stands back and he witnesses everything that he had made and behold he invites us to see what he saw to see what he sees he says behold it is very good and the next verse says and God entered into his rest And now he invites us through the agape of God to be led like sheep, like a shepherd leads the sheep into rest. Come on. <laughs> now Paul says the agape of God resonates within me. It's not a job description. You cannot buy it. One of the old, very well-known missionaries, I cannot remember his name. Maybe you guys would remember his name. He was, I think he was into building big orphanages in the UK. And someone of a big company where he was um, previously employed, when he left, uh, because he became so occupied with, with the gospel, they desperately wanted him back and so they offered him a very attractive salary. They raised the salary by several numbers and he again did not respond to their offer. So they raised it yet again and again and eventually they wrote to him, they said, Sir, um, is there something wrong with our salary? Is our money too small? And he wrote back, no, your job is too small. So Paul is not in ministry because the market in the tent industry has collapsed a bit. He has come to know something. He has come to see something that includes every person on the planet. in a language of equal value and he says the agape of God <laughs> resonates within me and then he explains where the echo the resonance comes from and again he makes a very simple calculation we're still in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14 he says because I am convinced that if one has died for all, then all have died. Now is that a difficult um, conclusion to come to? Whose love is God, is, is Paul talking about? The love of Christ the conclusion, the faith of God, what God believes. Remember, when Paul speaks about the joy of the Lord is my strength, he's tapping into whose joy? The Lord's joy. When the revelation of the gospel is from faith, whose faith are we talking about? God's belief to faith. You see, by design, we are at absolutely faith compatible we don't even need to be taught faith we've made so much of the teaching of faith that we just 
drag multitudes back into works. Because there's only one faith. It's from faith to faith. So when Paul makes the calculation, the essence of his theology, <laughs> and again, you know, the word theology, theo, God, logos, the logic of who? Of God. We've made theology our ideas of God. <laughs> You see, if you discover that you are the joy of the Lord, <laughs> you're going to stop complaining. You're to the heart lang. I mean, it's an idea. You can afford to wake up every morning or in the middle of the night whenever you wish with the immediate knowing that you are your daddy's delight. We've wasted so much time trying to delight ourselves in the Lord until we discover that we are His delight to begin with. Isn't it easy to love back when you know you are loved? Is one your eye. There's an eternity of agape behind you. You began there. Agape is who you are. Go and read in the mirror 2 Corinthians chapter 13. But brace yourself, strap yourselves in. <laughs> not now, and it's not going to go there now. You see, the love of Christ resonates in knowing, in Paul's understanding, he comes to an almighty conclusion. He says, if, now when Paul speaks English and he uses the word if, it is not a question mark. It is always an exclamation mark. By question mark, I mean condition. No, no, it's conclusion. Sometimes you read Romans 8, if God before us, you know, but uh, how can we get him to be for us? My darling, <laughs> God is as for you as he will always be for all eternity. It's a conclusion. It's an almighty exclamation mark. The gospel is one almighty exclamation mark. Every promise that God made, why would God speak in promise language? To convince us more convincingly, says Hebrews 6 verse 16. To convince us more convincingly. God doesn't make a promise to kind of you know, make himself a little bit more positive about you. Build up some energy. No, no. Even I, like this prophecy years ago, and someone got up and said, Oh, perilous times are coming, say the Lord. Dark days are coming. Even I'm scared, says the Lord. <laughs> So God doesn't float into faith mode from time to time, you know, when we praise Him enough and we give Him enough money and we mean our prayers sincerely enough and loudly enough. You cannot get God not to be in faith mode. God is absolutely persuaded. Jesus is proof of God's persuasion about you. We are talking about the testimony of God. We're not comparing man's testimony, man's ideas. Jesus is God's testimony concerning you. Paul says in 1 John 5 verse 9, If we have received the testimony of man, the testimony of God is greater. So let's hop back to 2 Corinthians 5.14. So Paul says, if one has died for all, Whose faith are we talking about? What God believes. So without our permission, God already believed that enough happened in the man Jesus Christ, in his incarnate birth, in his life in the flesh, in his death, in his descent into hell, in his mighty resurrection, in his ascension to be forever elevated far above every name that can be named. God believes that you and I 
were there, fully represented, fully included. Can you begin to understand why Paul dare say to a bunch of idol worshipping Greek philosophers that the God of creation is not far from each one of us? Because in this understanding there can no longer be an us and them. Paul is not going into Tata Machansa mode, <laughs> trying to just take a large guess. You know. He comes to a place of soon echo. You see, the mountain is not trying to squeeze out some sound that sounds like water. The mount mountain is simply positioned where the sound happens, where the echo happens. Huh. When Isaiah chapter 40, it's a fantastic chapter. Maybe we'll touch on Isaiah 40 sometime this next week. In verse 9, and God says, get thee up. Now God's speaking King James Version there. It was written in the Cape. So if we're done, get thee up. Get thee up into a high mountain. Can you hear the strategy? You herald of good tidings. Get thee up into a high mountain. Lift up your voice with strength. Our immediate response would be, so what gives altitude? What gives volume? You see, good news carries with it an appeal do you know that the best news would be totally irrelevant if someone feels excluded? Meaning that good news is only good news when it's good news. In South Africa we don't go absolutely crazy and goosebumpy excited when the Red Sox beat a different color Sox in America. We're not that big into baseball. But our indifference to baseball does not make the results there invalid. Even though we don't get the goosebumps and the excitement. You see, when God spoke, the eternal logic, the language of the eternal romance in the man Jesus Christ, God spoke mother tongue language to the nations of this world. He embraced humanity in this one man. So Paul says, if one died for all, equals, how many died in God's economy? All died. We might as well read a bit from the mirror. Werner, waar sit ou hierdie dingse knoppie aan, broer? Hier sê nie. Daar sê. <laughs> oh, Werner has just put Kindle for me on. That's real one. Um, I might have changed it a bit. I might have let me go to the... This is the latest upgrade. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. Well, I've got to try to... Werner, Werner has done the whole Kindle for us and the upgrades and the updated... And so I'm just going to quickly read you here from 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh, my Lord. Oh. The love of Christ resonates within us. Verse 14, and leaves us with only one conclusion. Jesus died humanity's death. Therefore, in, in God's logic, every individual simultaneously died. And you can go and read the um, commentary note then get all excited about it. But right now, verse 15. Now, if all were included in his death. Do you see Paul's reasoning? Because he's made a very simple statement. But this statement is all important because it's so all-inclusive. Do you see when we talk 
football language again in the South African context we have all our different clubs represented in their colors and their representation could be very restricted to their interests and their team of choice but the moment we talk Bafana Bafana which is our national soccer team there is a new higher level identity that eclipses the exclusion that we've represented in our small little party politics ideas. So here in the context of God manifesting, exhibiting His eternal, original idea of you, we find ourselves in the immediate audience of the agape of God. So verse 15 he says, if we all were included in His death, how did we get there. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 says, Of God's doing are we in Christ. The Greek begins with the word ek again. Origin. Source. The source of our in Christness is by God's doing. We don't jump in and out of Christ. <laughs> because in him we live and move and have our being says Paul no quotes Paul Paul quotes Arat as the Greek philosopher we are indeed his offspring of God's doing are we in Christ whom God made to be our wisdom and in the wisdom of God he reveals to us how righteous we are how sanctified we are because of what redemption unveils Ephesians 1 verse 4 says, before the foundation of the earth, says the familiar translations. The word katabalo actually refers to before the fall. I mean, God found us in Christ before he lost us in Adam. It says before the fall of the world, before the fall of Adam. We're talking about our pre-Adamic innocence. Where God associated us. N, E-N, mean, meaning in Christ. So if we humanity if we discover ourselves in Christ by God's doing then we begin to get a glimpse of the faith of God of what God believes of God's persuasion God is not double-minded about you Jesus is God's mind made up about you every promise of God was made maybe or yes Yes. yes in Jesus meaning Jesus is God's yes to you and why would God speak this language because he awakens the amen in us so let's listen to Paul's reasoning here in 515 now if all were included in his death why were we included in his death because we were in him when he died. Remember in 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says, None of the rulers of this world understood the mystery. What was the mystery? It was hidden for ages and generations for our glorification. Do you know that God has your glorification in mind? so he spoke in hidden language and we're going to explore that in the course of the school over the next week he says the mystery was hidden in such a way that none of the religious and political authorities had a clue because in their mind they saw one man die. Yeah. Yeah. But what did God see? Humanity, Humanity yeah. died. You see, if the religious institutions had an idea of what was really happening there, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. Yeah. Whose glory are we talking about? <laughs> you are His glory. Remember, we're talking mirror language. Now with unveiled faces, we are all beholding the glory of the Lord. Now what happens when you look in a mirror? 
Who do you see? You see you. That means you are His glory. Unveiled in the man Jesus Christ. The days of window shopping the Bible are over. Oh, we've claimed so many promises until we discover how every promise already claimed us. There is only one valid altar call and Jesus responded to it. When he died your death. Now if one died for all. This theology struggles with the idea that all were equally included. But the agape of God does not struggle. Because the dimensions of the love of Christ surpasses knowledge. Yeah. We'll get to that in Ephesians 3. Its length yeah. and its breadth. Yeah. Speaking about its horizontal extent. I mean, how far can you go with the all-inclusiveness of the love of Christ? How far can we go geographically? Certainly there should be some borders where you go into hostile territory. Where Jesus is not welcome here. <laughs> oh, my brother, what a wonderful testimony. I hope there's an opportunity for us to share your testimony, Russ. <laughs> About this man who came there for healing in China. Oh. And what's happening right now in Kuwait. You see, I want you to see something. God's resource in this world is vested in your innermost being. Stop looking for the next great preacher to emerge. It would be the wrong one to follow if what he says does not immediately awaken the greatness of your I am is. It's not gospel. It's make-believe what entertains this world for ages and generations under the fake father identity. The father of lies. There is only one authentic father of the human race. And he's not in competition with no devil of anyone's definition. Whatever principalities and powers and dominions represented, they all were disarmed on the cross and they were made a public spectacle it amazes me how sincere uninformed Christians can preach a defeated devil back into business there is a reference to our faith that carries more authority than make believe mode there is an understanding that the gospel of truth communicates that awakens our understanding because it's from faith to faith it's meant to be that way do you know where this faith comes from? I'll quote the King James again from Galatians 5 and verse 6 faith worketh by love the agape of God ignites faith if we preach the agape of God we don't even need to teach faith because faith just happens yeah. <laughs> you fall in love not because of 10 principles of belief I'm going to start trusting this per partner to be my partner <laughs> love awakens belief sure. if people are told how loved they are faith happens the agape of God Oh, brother, I'm not going to switch it. I'm going to go to the other side. Okay. Oh. Now, if all were included in his death, can we get a nod of a head there? We are in agreement. Yes. <laughs> we're in agreement with God. We're saying the Amen to God's initiative that in the death Jesus died, we were all included. We are no longer part of the group that says, oh, no, 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 this is, this is taking the love of God a little bit too far. Don't go into extreme grace now. <laughs> Remember the woman who traveled all the way to um, Israel. She was the queen of the South, Central Africa. 
and she saw all kinds of Twitters and Facebook messages popping up, you know, about this wealthy, wise king in a desert land. And eventually she was so bombarded with the gossip that she thought, certainly there can be no one wiser or wealthier than I am in Africa. I own the diamonds, the gold, the ivory. So she loaded her camels to go and compare notes, obviously. And when she met with this King Solomon in Jerusalem, she made this statement. She said, behold, the half has not been told. In Luke 11, Jesus makes reference to this and he says, a greater than Solomon has come. <laughs> there is no exaggeration to these dimensions, the length, the breadth of the agape of God that surpasses knowledge, it's depth, it's height. If we were included in his death, we were equally included in his resurrection. This unveiling of his love redefines human life. Did you hear that? This unveiling of his love redefines human life. Your job description, your highs, your lows, your histories, do not define you. You are defined by the author of your being. Yeah. The one who knew you before he formed you in your mother's womb. Who knew your unformed substance. Who called your day. It's the same one who breaks on the horizon of your hearts with the light of life, the true light that enlightens every man has come. He has no competition with the next and the latest brand of altar or shrine or any definition we would like to decorate our Christian ideas with. He has come to be unveiled in human form in the only address God has for eternity clothed in human form so that we may with unveiled faces behold him his glory as in a mirror and be transformed into his likeness yeah. Likeness is the language of the Incarnation. And in the Mirror Bible, I've got a whole chapter on the Incarnation Code. It's what the Bible is all about. A redeemed image and likeness. Whose inscription, whose face do we view here? Everyone in Jesus' audience immediately recognized Brother Caesar. And Jesus says, well, return to Caesar then what belongs to Caesar. But here comes the punchline of the gospel and of the mission of Jesus. Return to God what belongs to God. The last coin never lost its inscription. Therefore, it never lost its original value. The gospel is the unveiling of redeemed value. Yeah. Oh my, it's six o'clock. If we were in him, in his death, we were equally included in his resurrection. This unveiling of his love redefines human life. Whatever reference we could have of ourselves outside of our association with Christ, is no longer relevant and that's our introduction to our teaching tonight at seven god bless you let me just um
advice, Lydia. So is there an announcement about the food, Lydia? 